Okay, well, well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Abahan, and the amazing RPR Central Asia team for asking me to have the honor of opening this session. It's really just uh, so wonderful to see all these faces and the um, always better to be in person, but the magic of online meetings mean that we can actually bridge these gaps and come together uh, more often and more easily and in greater number and uh, and at better cost. So it's great to see everybody and thank you so much for joining. My name is Anthony Borden. I'm the executive director of the Institute for War and Peace Reporting. And I'm really honored uh, to be able to ask to be to be asked to uh, open this session, this expert panel discussion titled "Bringing Horizons: Strengthening Cooperation Between Central Asia and Central and Eastern Europe." So, on behalf of the Institute for War and Peace Reporting, I welcome you all very warmly. I take the opportunity to thank everybody for carving out their time to participate, the speakers and the participants in particular. Uh, I want to always thank our terrific Central Asia team, which is not always in the least Abahan, although he's our wonderful leader, but we have a fantastic team. You guys do a great job. And I'm so pleased at all the work, great work you do. And of course, those uh, supporters who work with us, we are supported by a number of uh, donors and agencies, and we're grateful to all of you. Uh, it's great to see uh, the delegation here on the call. And uh, we always particularly thank our friends at the Norwegian Foreign Ministry under our program, Amplify, Verify, and Engage. We sincerely thank them for all their support. The title of this topic is Regional Cooperation. And to say that we support cooperation, it's a bit like saying you like water and air. Um, it's a bit obvious. But obviously, it gets much more complicated to really get to the bottom of on the what basis uh, that cooperation can be built. What forms will it take? What levels through what institutions or none? Will it be institutional or civic or a combination? And above all, on what values will that cooperation be based? Um, so it is not always so easy, even though it seems quite straightforward from the start. I've had the great benefit, um, partly because of our wonderful programs inviting me to travel to Central Asia, the Caucasus uh, over the recent months. And I just got back from my most recent trip in the Ukraine just a couple of days ago. And I could um, more than anything, obviously reflect on the great differences and the challenges that all of these countries and regions face. But at the same time, I see great similarities and urgent needs for cooperation, for um, uh, understanding, especially at a citizen's level, and for particularly focusing on the values on which this cooperation can be based, because the challenges are huge, but the things that ought to unite, unite us uh, are, are even deeper and more profound. So uh, that's really a, a, an underlining lesson from my travels. And I've seen many of our regional programs with great excitement, and especially the young voices from the region, and particularly in Central Asia. So there's lots of uh, enthusiasm and optimism uh, amid all of the challenges. We're here to engage today in a constructive dialogue and share insights and explore potential recommendations for further development of cooperation. Our discussion is the result of the policy brief publication prepared by IWPR and our author and partner and host for today, Eldeniz Gusenov. And this brief forms the foundation of our discussion today and our colleagues will be soon providing the link to the policy brief on our Cabareza uh, website platform so you'll be able to uh, get, get it directly. Um, above all, it's a great opportunity to have a rich conversation on such a vital topic and thank you all again for joining. Thank you for asking me to participate. And Eldenise, I, I uh, pass it over to you to lead uh, what I'm sure will be a really important discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, esteemed guests. First and foremost, I extend my gratitude to Mr. Anthony Borden, IWPR's executive, executive director for Central A for executive director for his insightful opening remarks. Today's fruitful discussion and the insightful policy brief on our agenda have been made possible by IWPR and by the Central Asian Bureau for Analytical Reporting, to whom we owe a great deal of thanks. My appreciation also goes to the Kabar Black Asia team whose unwavering support for the initiatives of emerging professionals and seasoned experts has been indispensable. In these times of rapidly evolving relations between the European Union and Central Asia, it's crucial to highlight strategic role of Central and Eastern European countries. These nations serve as pivotal links connecting Central Asia with the European Union. This year's 2022 and 2023 
marked significant milestones in the relations between these regions, demonstrated by an uptick in high-level bilateral visits and a boost in trade. Our gathering today is aimed at delving into potential opportunities and exploring new avenues for cooperation through the lens of the expert community from Central and Eastern Europe and Central Asia. I'm profoundly thankful for your presence today as we navigate this critical dialogue for the advancement of our interconnected regions. We are honored by the contributions from our esteemed speakers. Mr. Maciej Madlinski, the head of the political press and information section of the delegation of the European Union to the Republic of Kazakhstan. Dr. Mara Gubaidulina, the director of the Center for German Studies at Alfa Rabi Kazakh National University. Dr. Maris Adjans, the director of the Center for Geopolitical Studies, Riga. And Mr. Aludin Kamilov, the chief research fellow at the Center for Progressive Reforms with his progressive presentation from Tashkent. Your insights today will be invaluable, and I'm confident that the discourse we share will resonate and lead to fruitful collaborations. Thank you all once again. I would like to touch upon very briefly some technical, technical regulations. We are holding this event on record and taking occasional snapshots. So in case you are not comfortable with that, please, um, uh, please let us know, kindly inform us by writing to our colleagues in the chat box who have an IWPR in their names. However, we will appreciate if you stay with your cameras on so that we have a sense of being all together. Please drop your questions in the chat box during the event. We will read them out when the time for the Q&A session comes. Finally, we are providing a simultaneous interpretation during the event. So this message is for Russian speaking audience. Мы обеспечиваем синхронный перевод во время мероприятия. Поэтому, если вы хотите переключиться на русский язык, выберите русский язык на нижней панели в Zoom со знаком Globus. Если у вас возникли проблемы, пожалуйста, напишите нашим представителям, которых вы можете найти в чате с припиской IWPR. So let's start with our first presentation. Our first speaker is Eldonis Gusainov, me. And I would like to share my screen and start my presentation with opening remarks and um, recommendation for um, policymakers in Central Asia. Uh, can you see my presentation? Uh, let me restart. Let me restart a bit. Sorry for, for that. Here's my presentation. Great. So let's start. <clears throat> It's good to welcome everyone back. Since I am the author of the policy brief, I would like to start today's discussion and focus on recommendations for decision makers in Central Asia countries to strengthen bilateral relations between Central Asian countries and Central and European countries. So what prompted this topic? I'm passionate about data processing through the R programming language. So I managed to, do, to download news from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Kazakhstan through the organization's official uh, Telegram channel. I decided to do a content analysis uh, and count how many times you countries are mentioned in 2021 and 2022. So you can see here two, uh, two graphs, this number of mentions of European countries in the news of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Kazakhstan. And I was surprised that there's a trend of increasing mentions of Central and Eastern European countries, especially during the crisis in 2022. So we can see uh, the frequency of mentions of Hungary, Poland are first place in 2022. And also we can see like a frequency of mentions of Romania and Lithu Lithuania and other Baltic states and from of other uh, Eastern and uh, Central European states. In addition, there have been uh, high-level visits. For example, uh, Serdar Berdukhamedov uh, made his visit to Europe after becoming president of Turkmenistan in Hungary. And Viktor Orban, prime minister of, of Hungary, recently made his first visit uh, to Turkmenistan. We can also add the first visit of prime minister Petr Fiala of the Czech Republic to Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan this year. Uh, what is bridging both horizons? So firstly, the countries in both regions are located near major economic players such as Germany for, for the in the case of European countries and China and Russia in the case of Central Asian countries. The current crisis has influenced the desire of these players to invest more actively in the countries of Central and Eastern Europe and Central Asia. And in some places, they're 
they even relocating entire production uh, facilities to these regions. Due to the geographical proximity, this creates opportunities for economic cooperation. Secondly, many Central and Eastern European countries seek to promote cooperation with Central Asian states at the EU level. This phenomenon was described by Professor Fabienne Bossu of the University of Ghent, who called it the Eurasianization of foreign policy of European states. She cited Romania and Latvia as examples. Uh, in addition, uh, there is an emerging trend of increasing numbers of staff um, from the Central and Eastern Europe countries in EU bodies, some, in some cases above the proportion of the population of these countries in, in the EU. So from my point of view, this creates an uh, opportunity to promote interest of Central Asia states in the EU, I mean, like uh, through countries of the Central and European, uh, Central and Eastern European countries. And thirdly, due to the legislative environment and geographical proximity, Central Eastern European countries can be seen as countries where logistics and maybe even production hubs can be located to increase non-resource export to other EU states. Here you can also see example of Uzbekistan, which wants to open a uh, logistical hub on the territory of Hungary just to expand its uh, trade cooperation with other uh, member states of the European Union. And here you can see three main policy recommendations. Actually, uh, more uh, recommendation in the policy brief, so don't hesitate to read it. And in order to develop recommendations for this paper, I decided to focus on the foreign policy of Hungary, which has been pursuing an open to the East strategy since 2010. As part of the strategy, the country has become very active in signing uh, strategic declarations of cooperation, of partnership uh, with Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and Kyrgyzstan. After that, the country started to actively launch various uh, investment projects, um, for example, some business projects uh, to develop economic cooperation, for example, joint investment funds in Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and Kyrgyzstan. In addition, Hungary is now actively looking for opportunities to increase energy supplies for Central Asia, in particular from Turkmenistan. So Hungary used its this platform like a common some like uh, linguistic similarities or common originality from like from East Siberia so this uh, relations between Turkic nations and Hungary just to promote its cooperation with Central Asian states and we can see here like uh, first my first recommendation is to initiate a uh, bridge horizon foreign policy at one of the consultative meeting of uh, Central Asian leaders. And here you can see two graphs. Um, for the first graph is about Hungarian export to Central Asian state, states. And the second one is about imports from Central Asian states to Hungary. And what can we see that um, actually uh, the current exports from Hungary to some Central Asian countries have been gradually, gradually increasing since 2010. So since Hungary has uh, launched this strategy opening to the East. And we, at the same time, the exports of Central Asian countries, with the exception of Kazakhstan, remain rather at the, at the low level. That's why I decided to propose to Central Asian states to also anon, uh, announce the foreign policy concept, bridging horizons, at one of the consultative meetings of uh, Central Asian leaders to, in order to give a sign to Central and Eastern European countries about the desire of the countries of the region, of the Central Asia, to further expand cooperation with them. This concept could be extended to, to some other regions of the world. The announcement of the such concept, co concept should increase the subjectivity of Central Asian countries because earlier they were, they were actually aims of some other uh, foreign policy concepts, some other act external actors. So within the framework of this concept, it's possible to announce a year of Central Asian countries uh, in the countries of Central and Eastern uh, Europe. For example, um, for example, 2009 was the year of Kazakhstan and Germany, and 2010 was the year of Germany and Kazakhstan, which significantly influenced the development of economic and trade relations between the two, between two countries. Here you can see also the graph with dynamics, uh, with the growth of trade between Germany and Kazakhstan after the organization of these events. So I think they need there is a need uh, to to I think the needs to be more em emphasis on cooperation with think tanks from 
Central and Eastern European countries, especially on the issue of information sharing. It will be possible to launch cooperation between different think tanks on information exchange so that analysis from Central and Eastern Europe countries could have a first-hand knowledge of Central Asia when developing uh, recommendations. So here are three steps which Central Asian states could use just to promote uh, deeper cooperation with think tanks from the Central and uh, Eastern Europe, like identifying cooperation themes and knowledge centers, after that establishing publication exchange, for example, a strategic uh, center of strategic studies from Kazakhstan could maybe cooperate with the center of strategic studies in, in Latvia, and they could maybe like mutually publish articles on different interesting issues for both sides. So they could promote this cooperation and exchange uh, information just to uh, rise uh, awareness of both regions. And if you want to, if you wish to read our policy brief dedicated to the topic of our discussion. Scan the QR codes for more details. Here is the first Q, uh, QR code for policy brief in, in English, and the second one is uh, in Russian. So thank, thanks a lot for your attention. And let's move on to the next presentation, actually also related, related to the topic of, of my presentation uh, from Mr. Matsey Madalinsky on the topic lessons from Central Asia from Central and European, uh, Central European cooperation. Mr. Mandalinsky, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Gusenov. I have to say that um, uh, well, I was, when I saw the title expert panel, I was really you know, flattered that uh, uh, I'm part of the expert panel. I don't consider myself an expert, but uh, well, trying to be a practitioner of everyday relations uh, with Kazakhstan uh, here um, on behalf of the European Union. And uh, also it happens uh, being from one of the Central European countries from Poland. So I thought that uh, maybe uh, some reflections could be, could be uh, relevant to our discussion. But also, I mean, the title was also like... Uh, you know, mm, quickly proposed, uh, and uh, mm, let's uh, let's hope that also word lessons is not too serious uh, because it's just a couple of thoughts and uh, and uh, reflections on on uh, how I see from my from my both background and practical uh, work here in Kazakhstan uh, and the region. Okay, I mean, also used to work in the region in other countries. Um, uh, how I see similarities, differences. Uh, yes, perhaps some lessons and some and some uh, uh, conclusions that can be drawn, uh, and some comparisons, but without uh, too much. Uh, uh, I mean, while being, uh, of course, very very wary of um, uh, simplistic comparisons, uh, because the regions are both of them are very diverse, and also they are they are different from each other. So, <laughs> with this start. Um, Yes, uh, we uh, uh, the diversity of both regions. I think maybe uh, it's something that uh, um, I have seen already previously when when uh, maybe exactly 20, 30 years ago, uh, when uh, I would say external observers uh, saw the Central and Eastern Europe as homogeneous, and and of course it's not. Uh, the same uh, maybe now or maybe not only now, but but for me, for example, let's say a process of, I don't know, the last 10 years uh, to see also the Central Asian region uh, that uh, initially uh, it's uh, without much thinking, let's say, or without focus previously on the region, uh, one would think that, uh, yes, obviously relatively homogeneous, similar, similar history, simi similar geographical position, but uh if it can be a small lesson is that it, it's it's definitely that both regions are very diverse uh what is for me personally the the um has, al has always or at least in the last 10 years the attraction of central asia is that it's on two border lines yes i mean as you of course uh, every one of you knows both uh, the southern uh, <clears throat> now mm, avoiding any qualifications like the last uh, like the last uh, where was that in in bloomberg um the southern uh neighborhood of russia well objectively 
and also the border the the the, the, the border uh, of the world of potentially radical islam i mean first of all afghanistan so uh this is a very complex Uh, it's obvious, but uh, it's meaning that uh, the changing uh, borders, Russia, Belarus, uh, Kalinin, on the eastern side, uh, at least for today, um, because obviously there are migration threats, there are, there are um, obviously global threats uh, of, any, of any possible nature, but uh, in a simplistic way, we can we can say that while Central Asia is facing, let's say, two uh, even geographically diverse challenges, then uh, for Central Europe it's more it's more one sided. Uh, then uh, still, uh, for example, on the issues related to, to China, uh, which is uh, a global power. Uh, a top global power and uh, uh, in this sense the, the traditional uh, the traditional geographical indications maybe don't matter that much because China is present everywhere uh, that's why no east no no north or south but simply Chinese Chinese presence as such uh, is a challenge obviously for both regions um, and uh, here I think that uh, Central and Eastern Europe, all the or the Balkans have learned uh, the hard way um, mm, the risks of uh, mm, unregulated uh, Chinese economic activity. Uh, and uh, for example, in my country, Poland, there was a very mm, loud example which uh, for many years served then as a let's be honest warning, uh, which was the which was the 2012. Poland Ukraine uh, uh, European football championship with uh, China uh, ready to uh, to construct the one missing very important east west highway uh, basically linking Warsaw to to the western border Berlin and further to Europe there were still at the time several missing uh, links uh, several missing sections of that highway of absolutely crucial importance. I mean, especially in view of exactly of this major international football event. And uh, the uh, mm, the story ended with a big disappointment uh, and uh, some um, very fast uh, expedited retendering was needed in order to find other uh, contractors than the Chinese. Uh, and somehow the thing was uh, this, the thing ended up successfully in the last minute before the championship started. So uh, there, that was definitely a lesson that at least in Poland, I think it uh, left a, a very clear mark that uh, Chinese uh, investments need to be uh, scrutinized really, really very seriously and seen with, uh, and, and especially major ones that that's important for the country's infrastructure, uh, that um, they 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 should be looked at with uh, with 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 caution and and also then when I said the Balkan countries, I mean uh, candidate countries like Montenegro, uh, there is this north north south highway uh, which is being built by China and uh, as far as I know. Um, uh, neither the traffic nor the the, um, um, the, the let's say needs assessment uh, they don't justify that uh, that huge investment at this moment uh, and obviously here we're entering something that is really of a major warning for Central Asian countries meaning uh, debt uh, dependence on, on on China and I think that's uh, uh, that's the case of Montenegro in this case. Uh, uh, of course, I'm not focusing on that region, but that's my understanding that they are that they entered this uh, trap of in indebtedness to China, and uh, that's uh, something that we know which we know also in Central Asia in a very we see it in a very clear way, in, uh, especially maybe maybe less in Kazakhstan, but more in some other countries of the region.
Uh, then also, uh, if we if we mention transport infrastructure, then obviously energy infrastructure, uh, a, a very important area where where uh, we are bringing, just like in transport, also in in energy, we we're trying to bring uh, Europe in general and 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 Central Asia to closer together, uh, and. Uh, uh, for for Central Asian uh, and and then both on the one hand and Central Euro European partners, there there were simply some direct interests. So Central Europe, not just as part of the European Union, but on its own. I mean, quite a few countries of Central Europe uh, are consumers of, for example, Kazakh uh, oil through delivered through through the CPC uh, through Russia, and 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 uh, for those countries, just like for for Europe in general. It becomes very important to look at uh, to look at alternatives, which of course are uh, a question of much longer um, uh, something with much longer horizon than than uh, uh, as it is for infrastructure. Th th uh, therefore, um, for the moment, uh, Central European countries plus Germany uh, rely on the on the on the transit through Russia. There is also investment. Uh, I think that Hungary was mentioned quite a lot. Uh, we just um, learned here sorry, after Orban. Um, mm -hmm. Mr. Mandolinsky, one minute left. Ah, so so maybe maybe then uh, let me just quickly finish with this investment. Gas investment, new gas investment by Hungary, we just learned from the ambassador after Orban visit. And obviously nothing new, the big Kazakh investment in Romania's oil sector, the KMG International. Uh, then, um, as I said, it's uh, it's a, what I'm saying is a, is a collection of 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 points from several areas. Uh, the formats uh, quite important. You know that there is a proliferation of formats uh, between, uh, let's say, Japan and Central Asia, U.S. and Central Asia, even Russia now in Central Asia, and that starts to also involve uh, European countries. We have now Italy and Central Asia. We we had recently Germany and Central Asia. Uh, and me as representing representing uh, European Union uh, institution. In addition, I would say that uh, uh, for us it's more practical if uh, we channel uh, our interest. I mean, European countries channel their interest through the existing European Union Central Asia dialogue. And I think that Central and Eastern European countries, let's say, will not have the scale. Uh, and I truly hope that in, in in general, I hope that the proliferation of formats will stop and actually the Central European countries are well placed to actually use European EU channels and not building their own Central Asia plus uh, Central Asia 5 plus 1 uh, as those countries <laughs> that I name Italy and Germany that uh, that did so uh, and then obviously we, we, we have education cooperation we have trade cooperation we have investment cooperation where um, interest of Central Europe in Central Asia is huge and, and growing, but hopefully can be largely channeled also through existing European Union Central Asia cooperation mechanisms. Also, one one sentence: uh, Central and Eastern European countries are very well placed, I think, to pass messages on Ukraine. Uh, and uh, let me just quote one quick example from this summer: Our delegation here, together with Stratcom colleagues in Brussels, we organized. A trip of journalists to Poland and, U and Ukraine, where we took one Kazakh journalist. I think it was a good start, and we can have more, and not from other Central Asian countries, and uh, establishing closer relations also between media, uh, think tanks mentioned uh, previously, but also media, um, independent media between the regions, Central Europe, Central Asia, with a view also to promoting the European uh, view on Ukraine and on Russia's aggression. Of course, extremely important for us. Uh, finally, last sentence. Uh, if we're talking about Visegrad, let's say cooperation as something that is developing uh, within the EU uh, as as closer uh, as closer mechanism like 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 Benelux. Well, unfortunately, now the issue of Russia a little bit, I mean, or even a lot, endangered this model. That's why I don't I don't see currently many lessons, I mean, except only that Russia, as always, can be div divisive. And I think we see it also to some extent in Central Asia. Uh, countries are, some of them are part of CSTO, some of them are not. 
Some of them are part of the Eurasian Union, so on. Some of them are not. Some of them can say things that are a little bit uncomfortable to Moscow, some of them not. So simply, we as EU, of course, are a big, big supporter of true regional Central Asia fight cooperation, but, but Russia is a disturbing factor here, in my view. Thank you very much. Pasiba Rahmit. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Madalinsky, for your presentation, for your insightful presentation on different dimensions of cooperation between Central Eastern uh, European states and also Central Asian states. And I think that it's um, you touch upon different dimensions, also political dimension, and we could uh, get known with the European point of view. So now I have an opportunity to get uh, known better with, with Central Asian uh, vision on this on this topic. So we have now a presentation from Dr. Amaro Gobaidulina, uh, Prospects for an Enhanced Partnership in the Context of the EU Strategy for Central Asia. And dear speakers, in order not to disturb you, I will just show such a, so, <laughs> so that you have only uh, two minutes left for your presentation. So please uh, keep an eye on the screen. So I, I hope you could see, you could see that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Mara Shokatovna. Мы вас не слышим, вы не включили. А, все. Uh, спасибо большое за приглашение. Я впервые участвую вот в таком формате Кабар uh, и на вашей площадке. Приятно познакомиться с теми, кого не знаю. Я надеюсь, что европейская проблематика так или иначе сблизит научные интересы и наше возможное сотрудничество. Конечно, говорить о перспективах взаимоотношений Центральной Азии с Европейским Союзом прежде всего необходимо с точки зрения и прошлого, и настоящего. Маленький экскурс в прошлое, поскольку нас сближает с Европой и Центральную Азию уже более 30 лет. Итак, Эльданис сейчас поставит да, ну, такую очень коротенькую картинку. Эльданис, вы да, поставите? А, да, сейчас, сейчас. Ага, все, я продолжаю. С взаимоотношения между европейскими сообществами тогда и странами Центральной Азии начались уже в конце 91 -го года, 92 -го год. Они оформляются последовательно с каждой из стран Центральной Азии. Спасибо. И отношения складываются постепенно, последовательно, пошагово, развиваются без особых серьезных таких пиковых ситуаций. Вот уже более трех десятилетий мы не видим серьезных противоречий, конфликтности во взаимоотношениях с таким крупным игроком, как Европейский Союз. Сразу необходимо ну, скажем так, уточнить и э, поддержать предыдущего спикера о том, что э, Европейский Союз изначально э, брал курс на региональное сотрудничество, то есть интеграционное региональное сотрудничество и изначально поддержал создание такого формата, как Содружество независимых государств, в отличие, например, от Китая, который изначально и по сегодняшний день предпочитает двусторонний формат, или Соединенные Штаты тоже предпочитают двусторонний формат сотрудничества. И вот такой региональный подход европейских сообществ и затем вот в этом году уже Европейскому Союзу 30 лет позволил эффективно внедрить и развивать такие программы, как ТАСИС, Трасика, КАСА и другие. И в плане энергетических вопросов региональное измерение Европейского Союза, оно всегда давало такую большую эффективность. 
Но а, с Европой получается а, отношения или взаимоотношения стран Центральной Азии складываются по-разному. Я остановлюсь в основном на примерах, конечно, с Казахстаном. С 94 -го года между нами существует базовое соглашение о партнерстве и сотрудничестве. Оно ратифицировалось Европейским Союзом в течение пяти лет. Пять лет понадобилось для ратификации второго соглашения уже о расширенном партнерстве и сотрудничестве, которое было подписано в 2015 году и вступило в силу только в 2020 году. Уже здесь вот возникает определенное противоречие в нормах, правилах и базовой структуре вообще подходов. Пока пять лет ратифицируется один базовый документ, проходит достаточно много времени, пять лет, и несмотря на временное применение отдельных положений, время меняет очень многие позиции в торговле, экономике, энергетике, в интеллектуальной сфере и так далее. Возникают новые совершенно риски, возможные даже и угрозы. И для, конечно, стран Центральной Азии вот это вот региональное измерение через стратегию а, имело свои преимущества, но и свои слабости и недостатки, потому что с включением в двусторонний формат а, с, сотрудничества о партнерстве а, Стратегия первая, которая разрабатывается уже в начале 2000-х годов и только к 2007 году рождается окончательный вариант первой стратегии для региона Центральной Азии. И э, Эльданис только что говорил, что э, вот, последние пару лет обозначены активным таким... Э, активными визитами со стороны стран Восточной Европы. Так вот, в 2005, в 2006, в 2007 году страны Центральной Азии тоже испытывали определенный такой массированный, что ли, визитерский подход со стороны лидеров, первых руководителей стран Европейского Союза. И в 2007 году Штайнмайер, будучи министром иностранных дел, даже высказал такое очень громкое, которое я прежде цитировала в своих публикациях. Наконец, 2007 год, представляете, наконец мы открываем для себя Центральную Азию. А прошло уже много-много лет, и он забыл даже про Александра фон Гумбольта. Но это к слову. В настоящее время Центральную Азию открывает Восточная, скажем так, часть Европейского Союза. Региональный подход к Центральной Азии, конечно, осложнялся и нашими внутренними противоречиями, и еще где-то в конце 90-х, начале 2000-х Такаев высказал такую мысль, что Центральноазиатский регион как таковой не состоялся по ряду причин, и одна из них – это конкуренция между лидерами государств Центральной Азии за более, скажем так, сильные позиции. Казахстан всегда, в общем-то, в своем дискурсе высказывался, что он региональный лидер, что это даже в дискурсе звучало такое понятие, как державность. И только в 2014 году, когда появляется такой полностью опубликованный стратегический документ по внешней политике Республики Казахстан, там Казахстан позиционирует себя как государство регионального типа. С этих пор начинается, ну, скажем так, сближение центральноазиатских государств в региональном смысле. И по сегодняшний день мы видим вот эту вот активность со стороны очень многих государств Центральной Азии, включая даже Туркменистан, быть более сплоченными, едиными, регионально значимыми и самодостаточными 
в меньшей степени зависимыми от каких-либо внешних факторов. Но внешние факторы, конечно, они играют серьезную роль, и один из них – это, конечно, страны Европейского Союза и Европейский Союз. Итак, для Центральной Азии Европейский Союз и Восточная Европа стали наиболее значимым элементом и актором с 2004-2005 годов, с вступлением сразу десяти государств восточноевропейских и стран Балтии в Европейский Союз. Конечно, в казахстанской внешнеполитической лексике мы исходим из обозначения всей Европы на подразделение даже Европы на западную часть, северную, южную и, конечно, восточная Европа. Восточную политику или восточную, восточный вектор Европейского Союза на себя взяла в свое время во внешней политике Германия. И она продвигала, конечно же, первую стратегию, вторую стратегию, достаточно активно действовала в нашем регионе. И когда в 2007 году был принят такой документ «Европейский союз и Центральная Азия. Стратегия нового партнерства, рассчитанная до 2013 года». Федерико Магерини тогда назвала нас «соседями соседей». Ну, вначале это прозвучало как-то несколько игриво, приемлемо для региона Центральной Азии, но потом вот это вот соседство или соседи соседей приобретает достаточно такой дистанцированно управляемый подтекст, который на сегодняшний день, конечно, меняет уже структуру, архитектуру наших взаимоотношений. Тем не менее, вот на вот этом слайде указано, что Центральная Азия как стратегический партнер, как стратегия для, для Европейского Союза сравнительно недавно до включения, скажем так, вот во вторую стратегию ЕС для Центральной Азии была выделена в качестве значимого региона. То есть региональное измерение Европейского Союза по отношению к нам остается. И хочется надеяться, что оно будет продолжаться и в дальнейшем. Хотя в последнее время звучит следующая мысль, что необходимо быть гибкими и каждой стране, в особенности западной части Европейского Союза, необходимо, ну, скажем так, адаптировать свои внешнеполитические интересы, экономические интересы, торговые интересы под меняющиеся обстоятельства. И таким образом для нас вот с одной стороны Центральная Азия сейчас идет к консолидации определенной сплоченности и кооперации ранее невиданного уровня. С другой стороны, это западный вектор и Европейский Союз, ну, скажем так, отходят от ранее или изначально принятого концепта регионального измерения наших стран, а мы находимся в срединной Евразии, являемся Хорошо, сейчас, да. да, я завершаю, являемся транзитной территорией для множества проектов, в том числе Китая, и китайский фактор это отдельная тема, которую следует обсудить, и для нас, конечно, есть выбор, либо китайские проекты в рамках одного пояса и пути, либо европейский, европейская стратегия и Европейский Союз с множеством различных проектов, которые обозначены, ну, к примеру, вот для маленьких заключительный такой элемент по критике, скажем так, финансовых и инвестиционных возможностей для Европейского Союза. Если первая стратегия закладывала 705 миллионов, 
а, евро для а, реализации первой стратегии, вторая – 1 миллиард, а, с, а, там, по-моему, 500 тысяч. А, в, а, Украина, допустим, на сегодняшний день, она получает уже... А, да. Я не знаю, в десятки, сотни раз ну, больше хорошо, как, ну, экономической нас, военной помощи. У нас да. очень, очень... Все, я завершаю. Да, а, отвечу да. с удовольствием на все вопросы, потому что эта тема, конечно, острая и требующая дальнейшего обсуждения. Спасибо за внимание. Спасибо большое за вашу инсайдную презентацию, доктор Мара Губайдулина. И мы можем сейчас поговорить о различных видениях, например, как от point of view of different sub-regions of the region of Eastern and Central, uh, Central European uh, region, like for example, Hungary or even Poland. And now we have an opportunity to learn more about Baltic angle. So now we have a presentation from Dr. Maris Ajans, impact of Russia's war in Ukraine on the perception of Central Asia in the EU, the Baltic angle. Thank you so much. Uh, greetings from Riga, uh, Latvia. So I have also prepared a brief presentation, so I will indeed try to um, outline the, the perspective from the Baltic states on Central Asia. So I have my presentation in a second. So there it is. So uh, to, to begin with, uh, the, I think Matze already mentioned that, uh, well, of course, uh, Central Asian countries are quite diverse, and so are also the Baltic states. So quite often we're bundled, you know, in the same group, uh, three sisters or three brothers, uh, Baltic states, but we're also quite diverse among ourselves. So uh, having said that, it's uh, slightly slippery, uh, you know, to bundle them also uh, together when it comes to the uh, these countries' policies towards Central Asia. But nevertheless, I will try to generalize things uh, for the sake of convenience. Uh, but anyway, when we speak about the Baltic states, I think Latvia has always been uh, more active uh, in engaging with the Central Asian countries. At the same time, um, in in the last decade, I would say uh, Latvia has lost uh, clout and activity in the region, and Lithuania has become slightly more active uh, than it was before. And uh, if you would compare uh, the, all the countries that we uh, are subject to discussion today, uh, well, uh, only the Baltic states were uh, part uh, of the Soviet Union. We were prisoners together with the Central Asian countries in the uh, prison of nations called uh, the Soviet Union. As a result of that, also, you know, economic culture and people-to-people -people relations were much closer than, for example, between Hungary or Poland on one hand and uh, Central Asian countries on the other hand. And as a result of that, um, I think there was quite uh, quite uh, quite good uh, level of recognition of the Baltic states still in Central Asian countries. So I've met uh, many people uh, also in Afghanistan and, and uh, of course in Central Asian countries that have studied in Riga or have served in the in the uh, Soviet occupation army in the Baltic states or have visited the Baltic states. So I think the recognition is still quite high, but it's fading uh, as, as generations change. And uh, nevertheless, uh, all three Baltic states have uh, established quite, uh, I would say, strong diplomatic presence, also economic relations and societal links uh, with Central Asian countries. Uh, then another point that I have to underline, uh, the European Union. So the Baltic states are members of the European Union for 19 years already. So how time flies so fast. So almost two decades, we're a part of the European Union. And I would like to say that we are proud members of the European Union. Uh, unlike some countries, uh, again, uh, Hungary uh, probably is an outlier. Uh, the Baltic states are at the core of the European Union. We are members of Schengen zone, of Eurozone, and, and the Baltic states are one of the main drivers of uh, EU Central Asia Policy. So the Baltic states quite often have underlined that the uh, Baltics are the advocates of Central Asia inside the European Union. And recently, in, in October 2023, uh, there, there was a joint roadmap agreed uh, with 79 actions in the, in the following key areas. I will not read uh, all of them, but I think this is a, a very important signal that the European Union still wishes to engage with, with the European Union. And why I'm, uh, I'm bringing this to your attention, because the Baltic states' uh, foreign policy will be closely aligned to that of the European Union. So they will not be outliers as some other countries when it comes to values um, and, and policies to um, external actors and Central Asian countries among them. 
And uh, now uh, to the point, uh, Russia's war in Ukraine and the Baltic states. Uh, for the Baltic states, Russia's war in Ukraine was the largest geopolitical shock in decades. And as you probably all know, the Baltic states are one of the staunchest supporters of Ukraine and also one of the fiercest critics of Russia. Uh, so the Baltic states have been in the avant-garde uh, in, in, in trying to support Ukraine in every way they can. And this has not been only you know decision or endeavor of the political elite. Now, there is extremely strong support uh, among the people of the Baltic nations. Uh, so, so there have been also multifaceted diversification and the desovitization initiatives in the Baltic states. Uh, so, so much was already done in the 90s, uh, but the last remnants of the Soviet occupation, uh, lost monuments, uh, lost uh, streets were accordingly um, well, demolished and remained uh, in the Baltic states. And uh, now, now I come to the point, uh, everything related to Russia is sensitive in the Baltic states, and uh, for quite a good reason. And uh, friends of Russia and also friendly acts towards Russia are perceived critically in the Baltic states. And uh, this is uh, where I would like to connect uh, things with Central Asia here. And uh, of course, uh, um, well, uh, we, we cannot uh, stay blind when it comes also to the traditional concerns about the uh, distance uh, towards democratic values in Central Asia. Uh, so there is uh, quite considerable uh, space for progress, to say the least. And uh, this has always been an issue uh, when uh, the Baltic politicians are trying to gauge with uh, Central Asia. So usually the journalists and uh, civil society bring the question, you know, what about democracy? Uh, so, so, you know, why, why do, do we be friends with uh, countries which are, you know, not progressing at the pace uh, that would be expected? And uh, when you see uh, Mr. Putin uh, visiting Central Asia uh, or Central Asian leaders visiting uh, Russia and some sports events where uh, Russia uh, participates, so it's automatically associated with uh, support to Russia. At the same time, of course, the you know expert community and officials have more nuanced view towards uh, you know the balancing acts of Central Asia. Uh, but this does not make it easy, uh, you know, for the, the Baltic uh, politicians to sell uh, Central Asia to the domestic audiences. Uh, and um, uh, to additional points, um, uh, th there are concerns about the waiting sanctions uh, that have been placed on Russia or Central Asia. Uh, well, in the last uh, two years, we've seen some spikes in statistics. Uh, that, for example, uh, suddenly uh, Kazakhstan or Kyrgyzstan exports, not, not exports, but imports uh, semiconductors. Uh, and uh, at the same time, uh, Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan starts, uh, well, considerable amounts of timber exports towards Latvia. And uh, there are concerns that uh, Central Asia is used as a platform to evade sanctions against Russia. And last but not least, in this slide, uh, recently there was an incident in Kyrgyzstan uh, when Kyrgyz authorities tried to detain and arrest uh, a Latvian academic, uh, a former politician, um, on, on the request of Russia. Uh, so this uh, now makes uh, even academics think twice uh, on, on visiting Central Asia. So, so you can try to visit Central Asia, but uh, can end up uh, in a prison in Russia. So this is a serious issue, uh, you know, for, for the future of relations. Uh, when it comes to the future of Baltic Central Asian relations, of course, the main challenge is and, it, uh, and will remain Russia. Uh, normal, um, sort of normal relations, I think this is quite, quite distant future uh, when it comes to the West and Russia, uh, unless the uh, regime of Putin uh, changes uh, or, you know, something different uh, fundamental happens in Russia, it's it's difficult to see, uh, you know, many, any better times coming. And uh, uh, there are also other risks for cooperation uh, apart from Russia. Uh, democratic backsliding in Central Asia, uh, or at least the progress that is not so fast as we would like to see. As I mentioned, it's, it's, it's increasingly difficult to sell uh, cooperation for, uh, with Central Asia domestically. Uh, well, we, I think it's also safe to say that there is also a decrease in Central Asian interest. Again, I'm you know, generalizing things uh, you know, to, to be, be on time. Uh, also, possible decrease in interest in business communities and also NGOs. When it comes to NGOs, uh, well, uh, there are also not that many organizations 
uh, that work with Central Asia, there are some, uh, but uh, quite often funding is the issue. Uh, since it's you know it's always about the funding here, you know for think tanks for uh, other civil society organizations and um, this is also uh, becoming an increasing issue. Uh, but last but not least, I think there is also a light at the end of the tunnel. This is the global gateway strategy of the European Union, which gives uh, some hope. And uh, also to conclude my presentation, a brief ad uh, on a report that we have published here at the Center of for geopolitical studies in Riga. Uh, it's called the Global Gateway in Central Asia, towards an EU-led post-new uh, Silk Road. Uh, so this is sort of an, uh, more like an inspirational um, report uh, with which uh, we are advocating uh, that the European Union uh, uh, tries to uh, use and prioritize Central Asian vector as a part of the global gateway, because otherwise, you know, there are many regions and, you know, what fits for everything maybe is not good for anything, as the saying goes. Uh, so for that reason, we advocate that uh, both uh, infrastructure projects when it comes to energy, transportation, digital, should be promoted both uh, in, in the east of the European Union, also Moldova, uh, Ukraine, so the three says initiative, um, uh, also the Caucasus countries and Central Asia should be uh, as, as much as possible brought together by infrastructure projects. And uh, here you can see a map that we have drawn, uh, which is um, is trying to depict a uh, crescent uh, bypassing Russia connectivity question. So this is what we are calling as a part of this report. And uh, here I will end my presentation and, and I hope there will be you know questions or comments and I'll be happy to engage on those points. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Marisa Jans. It was very interesting to get acquainted with um, with a perspective from Baltic states. And I remember I read your policy brief, and actually it was quite interesting to get to get to delve more into infrastructure dimension of cooperation between both regions. Because like now we try to develop middle corridor, and actually I was always asking myself how could it impact cooperation between Baltic states and Central Asia because they were connecting um, via the territory of Russia. Now they should be connected via the territory of Ukraine or other Central Eastern European states, which could also actually influence, influence cooperation between both regions. And we have discussed actually several uh, perspectives of different sub-regions of Central and Eastern uh, Europe. And now we can actually move on to another interesting topic from Alodin Komilov, and his topic, prospects and challenges, how can Central Asia and Central and Eastern Europe enhance cooperation on water and climate change? Mr. Komodilov. Yeah, thank you, Eldenis. Komilov, uh, the floor me... is yours. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, let me share my presentation. Okay. So, can you see it? Yes. Great. Okay. Uh, so my name is Alaudin Kamilov. I am from Uzbekistan. I am focusing on uh, regional cooperation, but recently I've been to Europe. I, I was doing research on global gateways uh, strategy, focusing on digital uh, di uh, connectivity on digitalization, digital connect uh, connectivity. Today I'm going to talk about this uh, water and climate issue as as we know this climate change climate change is a global issue that affects many regions of the world even central asia so region is going through unprecedented climate uh, climate crisis causing significant changes to environment at the same time affecting local population uh, economies and uh, eco ecosystem in recent years for example uh, central asia has experienced a significant uh, increase in temperature with average temperature rising one or two degrees Celsius over the last centuries. For example, um, in in June, the Turkmenistan reached uh, almost 42 Celsius degree. Uh, in, in temperature in Tashkent, steadily was 42 degrees also. But in South, people suffered under 44 degrees. It was the same I, I, uh, in Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, for example, in uh, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, temperature was expected to rise uh, till 45 Celsius degree. Uh, 
So this uh, increase in temperature also causing prolonged drought, affecting agricultural production and putting food security at risk. Uh, for example, uh, th there is uh, studies on this um, pro uh, prolonged drought uh, since uh, 1980s. For example, desert area in Central Asia uh, has expanded to east and north uh, uh, as much as 100 kilometers uh, in the territory of Uzbekistan and southern Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan and includes some part of uh, China. And at the same time, we should talk about this uh, water resources. As we all know that the water resources in Central Asia are connected by two uh, transboundary rivers, which is uh, which are Amur Darya and Sir Darya. But uh, studies also showing that uh, glaciers that feed these two main rivers are sh shrinking, but according to some empirical studies, it might shrink by more than half in, in, in within uh, several de de decades. Of course, this creates several social, economic, and geopolitical challenges, including migration. And we, sh we shouldn't forget to mention also uh, res reduce snow cover and increase frequency of natural di disasters. I think those people who were in Central Asia last winter will uh, remember very well the cold uh, weather and, and which caused uh, several natural disasters. And at the same time, uh, Central Asia is home to a growing population. Right now, we are over 78 million people, uh, which is uh, projected to exceed 85 million by 2030 and more than 100 million by uh, 2050. This is a uh, crucial, I would say, dire challenge. And we talk when we talk about uh, rivers. Recently, there was there were several articles in foreign policy talking about uh, about potential conflicts in Central Asia uh, because of this uh, water issues. And we know this uh, Central Asian countries. After dissolution of Soviet Union in 1991, they inherited uh, inherited a complex system of trading energy for water. For example, uh, downstream countries like Uz uh, Uzbekistan, uh, Kazakhstan, and Turkmenistan supplied supplied electricity generated from fossil fuels to upstream countries like uh, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan during the winter time. For upstream countries they stored water during winter time and uh, provided. Uh, these uh, resources to down, downstream countries during summertime for agricultural purposes. But since 1990s, uh, uh, there, there have been alarming increase in water consumption, reaching an unsustainable level. If you see in this map, here you can see RLC. In 1960s, it was uh, the fourth largest uh, sea on 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 continent on, uh, in the world, but because of this agricultural purposes and mismanagement of water, this became one of the environmental challenges in Central Asia, not only affecting uh, Uzbekistan but also Kazakhstan and, and Turkmenistan and areas um, uh, to this uh, sea. So, uh, and we should also talk about uh, the Taliban government in Afghanistan. Uh, we know that things was, uh, everything was complicated in Central Asia, but Taliban uh, is uh, now building, the Taliban government is building a new uh, canal, which is called Kushtepe Canal, which is expected to get to sort of the water, uh, which is... Uh, serious issue uh, because uh, despite this fact, despite this canal, Central Asian countries are suffering a lot, particularly Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan. And uh, Taliban government is not cooperating on this issue and they are building one of the biggest channels which are 285 kilometers. They finished first stage and they, are, they have already started second stage. And uh, according to studies, uh, this if we say Amurtario has 50 billion cubic meter water, they, they are now getting 20 uh, billions. Uh, 
uh, and some in Uzbekistan, this uh, an anecdote, uh, people who are living in in horizon of Bukhara are saying that they are already feeling this um, effect of this this canal. So this this is intensifying uh, competition for this in invaluable uh, resource in Uzbek in Central Asia, I would say, and also uh, bringing some letting generating some concerns about. Uh, water wars in Central Asia. So under these circumstances, so the, the, not only this, but uh, we know this recent uh, global trends and geopolitical development, including digitalization, the rise of assertive China, and this Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, have pushed uh, European Union very active in Central Asia. And, uh, and in response, in November uh, 2022, e EU announced uh, global gateways, uh, which included two uh, initiatives. One focus fo one uh, focuses on water, uh, energy, and climate change, um, which are which is aimed to co contribute to managing water and uh, energy resources, addressing uh, in environmental challenges, and tackling other. Uh, climate change issues in five Central Asian countries, Uzbekistan, uh, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Turkmenistan. So this uh, project has a uh, budget 700 million um, provided with initial, uh, initial, initial budget is 700 million euro provided by uh, Latvia, Romania, Slovakia. And at the same time, some um, Western European countries like Germany, uh, Italy, France, and Finland. Uh, so, and and other uh, other countries as well. Uh, this is initial uh, funding, but uh, there should be some more activities from member states to increase this uh, funding in order to support uh, these projects and bring more significant uh, positive change in in. Central Asia. So main idea is here, as uh, uh, matters mentioned about the U European Union and other member states' goals in Central Asia, they are trying to help Central Asian countries to to manage and this uh, their invaluable uh, this resource water, considering uh, and balancing the needs of downstream and upstream countries as i said before downstream countries mostly use uh, they they mostly use water for agricultural purposes but upstream countries they use for energy and energy purposes uh so we can talk about uh, possible um ideas uh, prospects for cooperation in water and climate so um, i believe uh, central asian countries could benefit from uh, the EU uh, this uh, cooperation with Central and Eastern European countries, uh, most specifically in the area of uh, environmental regulation and basic uh, uh, water management. For example, uh, Central and Eastern European countries, they have experience on managing the new river. There are lots of studies that Central Asian countries should use and their experience and get their uh, now acquire their knowledge on this and apply them to, to Central Asian countries. And at the same time, we can talk about uh, technology transfer. As we know, Central Asian countries are heavily dependent on fossil fuels. And they, the, 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 and another biggest problem is ineffective use of this water, water resources. So they can use some water technologies, uh, sa sa saving te te technologies and other renewable en energies. And we can also talk about uh, joint research initiatives. For example, uh, I, I, I checked that out of 13,488 journal articles in eight major journals focusing on Central Asia, uh, only 33 articles, which is uh, it's 0.24%. I think I think like academic communities and also uh, research communities should increase their cooperation on water management and tackling uh, climate issues in, in this region. We can also talk about this, for example, uh, 
climate change mitigation and adaption strategies. Uh, for example, uh, World Bank studies show that if the, the, there is no intervention, then then Central Asian countries can lose 1.3% of their GDP per year, and their crop yield will decrease to 30% uh, by 2015, which is uh, uh, which is a significant number. And th this will also cause uh, migration, not uh, the domestic migration. And the, the, the numbers show that it, it, the expected numbers will be 5.1 billion people with, with, in, in Central Asia. Of course, this case several uh, challenges, not only for the region, but wider Euro-Asian continent, I would say. Uh, of course, there are some challenges. Um, the, the biggest one is political and economic difference. So we know, all know that Central Asian countries has different political system. It's a bit hierarchical and they are not fully fledged democracy. So pro projects and uh, and uh, plans uh, might be implemented different in Central Asia. This also creates several challenges. And there is also geopolitical tensions among countries and people, uh, countries do not uh, trust each other still, despite the fact they are trying to work together, but still there is some tensions and and, and lack of uh, trust between countries. Of course, and at the same time, there is difference also in environment and climate conditions. And there is also culture and language barriers, for example, effective, for effective communication and mutual understanding. Um, language barriers might be significant also. And we can also talk about this, for example, other priorities, different priorities, regional uh, sorry, actors. Sorry, and... Mr. Kamodino, Kam Kamilov, uh, uh, lack of time. C could you please yeah. uh, finish your presentation? Thank you. Yeah, yeah sure, sure. So uh, overall, uh, there are the possible areas Central Asian countries and Europe, uh, Europe, Central and Eastern Europeans can work. There are opportunities and challenges, but despite this uh, different ideas about this uh, cooperation in this area, but uh, there should be, the future looks a bit uh, promising. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Kam uh, Kamilov. It was quite interesting to uh, learn more about new dimension of possible cooperation between both regions and I think we could we can discuss it further during our Q&A session and now we kindly ask all, all of you to fill out a short feedback form and evaluate the work of the speakers organizers as well as share your impressions. You can find the link to the feedback form in the chat box here. This will not take you more than five minutes and will help organizers to improve future events. Пожалуйста, запомните короткую форму обратной связи, которую вы можете найти в чате, и оцените работу спикеров, организаторов, поделитесь своими впечатлениями. Это очень важно для дальнейшей работы. Uh, dear Mr. Kamilov, could you please close your presentation and we can proceed to our Q&A okay. session? I, have, I saw some question, questions in the chat box, but please, dear uh, participants, don't hesitate also to ask your questions in the chat box. So the first question I saw was from, from Sergey. Russian normative economic political influence in Central Asia is getting stronger. Russian view of the West, especially of the Baltic states, Poland, and some other Central and Eastern European countries is not particularly favorable. In this line, how would you assess rapprochement of Central Asia and Central Eastern and Eastern Europe? What risk and opportunities such uh, rapprochement present? So who would like to start answering this question? And um, also, uh, Dr. Maru Gubaidulina, if you wish to answer in Russian, you can also uh, switch on your microphone and speak in Russian. I think that our uh, interpreter could, uh, our translator could also uh, translate your answer. Um, maybe, um, uh, Dr. Marich Ajans, as you spoke about uh, Baltic states, maybe could you answer the question? Yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I think also it's, it's a very valid question. I spoke uh, a lot about uh, the uh, 
uh, how toxic Russia is is perceived in the Baltic states. And uh, this uh, is going to be a challenge, uh, you know, at least from the perspective of the Baltic states. Uh, you know, there is like, you know, a dilemma. So on, on the van, one hand, uh, you know, we are not fond, you know, to cooperate with friends of Russia. At the same time, we understand, at least, you know, the expert community understands that, uh, well, this is a balancing act, uh, you know, that uh, Central Asia is, is in a rather uh, difficult, uh, you know, situation. You have, you know, China on one side, Russia on the other, and that the European Union is is, is unable and the West is unable, you know, to compensate, you know, any uh, losses that uh, Central Asian countries uh, would incur by, you know, uh, destabilizing links with Russia. Uh, so from the, my point is that Russia will uh, be the main challenge uh, and, and uh, you know, what I can hope that, uh, well, uh, Central Asian countries will uh, pivot a bit uh, more uh, towards the West uh, and uh, that also maybe China uh, can can help, uh, you know, maybe paradoxically, but in some kind, uh, you know, to, to, to divert Central Asian countries away from Russia. I understand it might sound a bit naive, uh, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm all for cooperation with Central Asia, but Russia is going to be a, a big issue uh, and, and, and the more friendly acts between Central Asian countries and Russia, the more difficult it will be for us, you know, to cooperate. Uh, I also have seen in the chat box so that someone wants to ask a question. Could you please just write the, your question in the chat box? And it seems to me that yeah, Dr. Mara Gubaidulna would like to add something here. So could you please... Uh... Switch on your micro. Ah, yes, yeah, your micro is on. Вопрос, uh, конечно, странам Балтии. Со стороны, может быть, какой-то иной ракурс виден, более четче выделяется. Мы все-таки граничим с Россией, Российской Федерацией. Это самая длинная граница в мире сухопутная. Семь с половиной тысяч километров. И разорвать эту границу, построить огромные заборы бетонные, непроходимые, это... Ну, нереально, и это даже не фантастика. С Республика Казахстан, как и другие центральноазиатские республики, придерживаются мультивекторного подхода. Поэтому для нас Россия один из важнейших приоритетов. Наряду с Китаем, с которым у нас почти две тысячи, километров сухопутной и водной границы 1700 с копейками. А наш приоритет – это Европейский Союз, Соединенные Штаты. И в последние годы мы а, говорим во всех центральноазиатских республиках наш приоритет – это Центральная Азия. Консолидация, сплочение, кооперация – интеграция даже в отдельных сферах взаимоотношений. Вот сейчас очень с удовольствием послушала по водным ресурсам выступление. Да, сейчас уже стоит серьезный вопрос о создании Центрально-Азиатского водного консорциума, то есть тот отрезок секторальной кооперации в Центральной Азии. И а, взаимоотношения с восточноевропейскими странами – это один из приоритетов во взаимоотношениях в целом с Европейским Союзом и по отдельности с отдельными его членами. Поэтому страны Балтии для нас сейчас важны. Я немножечко не соглашусь, Мари, Мари с вами. Торгово-экономические отношения, допустим, с Литвой на сегодняшний день испытывают очень высокий, динамичный подъем. Активность Литвы в настоящее время именно торговля, ну, является двигателем, можно, как выразился классик, двигатель прогресса. Поэтому а. страны Балтии для нас важны. В любом случае не надо обходить нас стороной и смотреть откуда-то с севера на юг, Мара издалека. Швака. Спасибо большое за ваш ответ. Maybe do, do our other speakers want to add something on this issue? Yes, uh, Mr. Madalinsky. Could you please switch on your microphone? Okay, we will wait for 
<laughs> uh, no, we don't hear. We are not hearing you. I sorry, you didn't switch. Okay, great, nice. Okay, I have seen that also Mr. Camille wanted to say something. Yes, please. We will wait uh, for Mr. Mandlinski. Mandlinski. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I totally agree with Marisha Katana because in Central Asia, we are directly board, we have direct borders with China and Russia and we all, everybody knows Russia is revisionist power. So if we talk about something against Russia, we will provoke to Russia. And now we are focusing on Central Asia, building on commonalities. We are trying to talk about our uh, history, culture, and building other uh, probably regional identity and uh, not to 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 discuss differences or focusing on security issues and others and this this might create uh, some other issues so that i i do not totally agree with your points respectfully thank you mr kamilov and also mr Malinsky. uh floor is yours yes uh, is it okay now yeah, yes, we are here. Yes, great. Uh, it was 30 seconds to, to un unfreeze. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I also don't want to, don't want to sound uh, also like a defender of this real politic that the border is there and Russia is there. But indeed, I for the Baltic states, especially, you know, I know that uh, Baltic colleagues here, even the embassies, they have mm, they have uh, transport diplomacy. And they and they simply are involved in uh, well promoting transit through Baltic ports, but for this, how do you reach the how do you solve the dilemma uh, of cooperation? I don't know with the Russian railways, which are essential if you want to Central Asian to, uh, partners to use your ports. So it's just uh, it's for me simply interesting from the point of view of understanding how yeah how you approach this dilemma, which definitely is there and. For a long time, will continue to be. Thank you. Uh, now we have the second question. Uh, it's more about also cooperation between both regions. So Botasha Ripova asks, um, I would personally have questions of view of CE and CA, I mean, like Central and Eastern European countries and Central A Asian countries as in between squeezed by the big players, Russia, China, EU. Also, of course, it's true. However, I think there's a merit of rethinking the deeper connecting roots, such as the so socialistic past and how it influences current realities in politics, economics, environment, management, culture, etc. There are many similarities and past dependencies which can be very promising for research and experience exchange. Um, so I think that we could also use maybe somehow our common history just to enhance cooperation between both states. But I mean, like the different perspectives of this common future like from for example for baltic states and they they perspective of the soviet uh heritage and also like from uh, other central asian states so what our dear experts what do you think on this issue so like how could we maybe rethink our history in order just to enhance uh, further cooperation Maybe, uh, Mr. Mandarinsky, well, yes, I see. <laughs> uh, yes, could you so maybe, maybe this time, this time, you know, I met here many people, many uh, wonderful and engaged uh, ex experts, for example, historians uh, who are passionate by the common uh, Polish uh, Kazakh um, history. And uh, in a way, it was often happening even. Uh, historical figures, uh, Valihanov, I mean, I, I, I have a book about that. Uh, they often would meet Polish historical figures in Russia, but um, they shared a lot of uh, actually common, uh, this common historical burden uh, of, of being subordinated to Russia. Yes, I mean, it was, I'm talking about 19th century when Poland was also actually together, let's say, with Kazakhstan and other countries in the empire. And uh, um, I was very moved by, diff by, by, by the book, actually, that, I, that I'm, 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 I'm talking about, uh, where it was uh, showing shared stories of struggle, of struggle for, for um, well, for, for, for independence. And, and actually, uh, 
Of course, history went differently for different countries, but I think this legacy needs to be brought back to mm -hmm. to be brought back to to the to the to the first stage and also more recent. Uh, I mean, the Baltic states. I mean, the Vilnius TV Tower and 1986 Almaty. Uh, the same part of the same struggle uh, than in this case in this case against the Soviet supremacy. So uh, I, 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 I I think that um, yes I, I was quite impressed by I discovered those things only when I arrived to Kazakhstan. Thank you. That's quite interesting to use some maybe like common historical events and also some like historical figures just to maybe like create some common projects and enhance cooperation. Maybe Dr. Marisa Jans regarding your presentation, maybe you like to add something on this issue. Yeah. Uh, thank you. History is, is, you know, quite paradoxical in our case. As I mentioned, uh, well, uh, uh, things related to Russia are toxic and, you know, there are many disabitization initiatives here, uh, but at the same time, uh, the, the uh, time that we spent together with Central Relations and uh, Soviet Union, it uh, brought us closer. As I mentioned, the people to people links were closer. As a result of that, uh, for the Baltic states, it's uh, quite often uh, easier to engage with the Central Asian counterparts because, you know, I think we better understand each other than, say, you know, Germans or French when it comes to Central Asian. So still um, um, many people here speak uh, the Russian language, which is, you know, quite widespread, of course, in Central Asia. Uh, so there is uh, also, you know, uh, some benefit uh, from this uh, dark uh, past. As I mentioned that, uh, you know, many people study here in the Baltic states, uh, you know, have visited the Baltic states before, uh, but this uh, mostly relates to the other generations and not anymore the, the young, younger, uh, you know, Central Asians. At the same time, we have more than 1,000 Uzbek students in Riga. Uh, we have direct flights uh, from Tashkent uh, to Riga. Uh, so, so this is also, you know, in, in many ways based on the, you know, historical legacy. Uh, so that, that has been helpful. And also a quick remark to what the um, uh, previous speaker asked about the uh, well Baltic dilemma, because uh, you rightly mentioned that the Baltic states are trying to promote their ports. So Klaipa, the Riga, Tallinn port uh, for uh, transit of uh, Central Asian goods. And indeed, uh, the Baltic states are doing this, and this is uh, uh, currently as the uh, number, uh, amount of Russian cargo go down, uh, it, it's slightly compensated by Central Asian cargo. But at the same time, it's uh, perceived uh, that uh, the trans transit uh, is already sort of a history because uh, Russia basically can close, uh, you know, the transit for the Baltic states at any time. At, uh, it's, it's, it's a decision at, at Russia. And, and, and the Baltic mm -hmm. states are building, you know, uh, the Royal Baltic project and other uh, initiatives uh, and uh, East-West uh, corridor is, uh, well, uh, promoted, but at the same time, uh, we'll, we'll not be surprised if it will cease uh, to exist in the foreseeable future. Th that's quite interesting. And I have to say that I was also in Riga and impressed by the architecture of your city. And I would like to ask maybe some of our Central Asian experts maybe to say something on this issue. But yes, please, Mr. Kamilov. And then we will move to the last question because we are running out. Yeah, uh, regarding to history, we shouldn't forget that Russia also had the, its own Orientalism. So when we read with Edward Said, he was arguing that with the passage of time, in, uh, empires, they will use history, music, and to 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 change the history to to direct their own purposes. So in Central Asian countries, we have big debate on 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 this historical past, and unfortunately, our his his history books are divergent. We are trying to focus on each nation's uh, their glorious history instead of focusing on commonalities. Now, uh, because of this new, uh, I would say, like new. Uh, generation and new, this because of this of course it's not just generation it's also because uh, because of these geopolitical challenges countries are talking about to focus on their common history commonalities rather than differences and um, rather than uh finding reasons to to distinguish uh, them from each other uh, basically if you see come to central asia like most of country, people like uzbeks kazakh and kyrgyz they can understand each other to, to, to large extent and they they had very 
common history yes that's quite interesting let's maybe focusing let's focus more on similarities between our both regions between central and eastern uh, european countries and central asian countries in our history books just to create maybe just to explain to future generations importance of co bilateral cooperation i mean like between both regions and now we have the last question about um initiative of three c's and i would like actually also unite this question with my question about trust between central asian states so my question what can central asian states learn from central and eastern european states in trust building measures so how can we based on experience of these states i mean central asia experience based on your experience of european central and eastern european states build experience because i know there were a huge amount of wars between central and eastern european uh, states and also like this, all border issues are quite similar to issues in central asia this is the last question and after that we will end our finish our um, uh, very interesting discussion. So who would like to start? Seems to me, uh, Dr. Maru Gubaidulina, you, uh, Dr. Maru Shokatna, you'd like to add something to say, to react on my uh, yeah, comment экономический, торгово-экономический, а затем политический, он искал тоже свою идентичность и свои основы. И все-таки начинал думать чуть ли не с римских времен и Карла Великого, что объединяло в прошлом, в течение многих столетий, вплоть до 1993 года, пока не создался вот Европейский Союз, что общего и какие национальные отличия все-таки есть. Поэтому нам терять вот на нашем евразийском пространстве прошлое и перечеркивать я не считаю большим смыслом. Но, конечно же, переосмысливать свою национальную идентичность и пересматривать определенные этапы в истории следует. Почему? Потому что я вот в настоящее время являюсь членом Государственной комиссии по политической реабилитации прошлого, которая была создана нашим президентом. И я нахожу там очень много доказательств тому, что были и плюсы, и были минусы именно в архивных документальных источниках. Um... Говоря о взаимоотношениях трех морей, у нас, пожалуйста, у нас нету трех морей, но у нас есть общее вот это евразийское пространство, и мы в свое время ставили вопрос перед нашим Министерством иностранных дел, и оно восприняло тоже очень ну, будем говорить так, позитивно, прямо в доковидный период, опыт Вишеградской группы экономический, политический, прежде всего взаимодополняющий вот те новые страны Восточной Европы, которые, несмотря на свои противоречия, противодействия и даже конфронтационность, и даже раздел, помните, да, Чехии и Словакии, тем не менее вошли в определенную, ну, скажем так, группу стран, которая взаимодействовала и в какой-то степени продолжает взаимодействовать в различных wow. проектах. Вот это один из опытов, который для нас тоже, наверное, привлекателен. Не обязательно его копировать, но он привлекателен во, wow. во многих смыслах. Марашок, как у нас да. а, также у нас Азамат Дарбаев поднял руку, вы могли бы раз да, 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 конечно, микрофон? Я послушаю. Я послушаю мы, все, мы все послушаем, что хочет Азамат сказать нам. Добрый день, здравствуйте. Эльдани, спасибо большое за приглашение. Не только Эльдани, организаторы, спасибо большое. Но я, наверное, не по данному вопросу трех морей. Хотел сказать, у меня есть отдельный вопрос, точнее сказать, два, две поправки. У нас, у нас, к сожалению, очень мало времени, можно? Один краткий комментарий, пожалуйста, потому что мы уже зашли за пределы. Хорошо, я, тогда у меня есть буквально один маленький комментарий, если можно. Это вот, сейчас скажу минутку господину Марису, у меня такой комментарий, ну, немножко такая ремарка, если можно. Первое, я бы хотел, ну, сразу хотел бы сказать, что 
вы в своем выступлении вы сказали, что визиты Путина, вот процитирую, визиты Путина и лидеров Центральной Азии в Москву рассматриваются как поддержка России с Европы. Но, наверное, нужно смотреть не в контексте того, что они посетили друг друга или еще что-то, нужно смотреть в контексте того, что там было сказано. И всегда на всех выступлениях по итогам этих визитов на конференциях Пресс-конференция глава нашего государства, президент нашей страны, он всегда подчеркивает о том, что отношения России и Украины, они, это их сугубо личные отношения, и Казахстан не выступал там с поддержкой или с иными какими-то моментами, связанными с российско-украинскими отношениями. Поэтому, мне кажется, здесь нужно немножко быть точнее в формулировках. А так, спасибо большое. Спасибо На самом деле, большое. Хотел много сказать, но, Спасибо. Конечно, за... Мы можем на эту тематику вообще обсуждать конечно, целыми, неделями, часами, годами. Очень долго можно об этом рассуждать и говорить. Uh, now I would like to suggest, uh, just to, I would like to offer to proceed to our closing remarks, ladies and gentlemen, as we draw this enlightening discussion to a close. I would like to extend my head, heartfelt thanks to all our discussion speakers. And of course, the audience whose engaging participation has truly enriched today's session. The depth and breadth <laughs> and expertise shared today have not only highlighted the significant strides made in fostering cooperation between Central Asia and Central and Eastern Europe, but also underlined the vast potential that still remains untapped that we were talking about. And we are walking away with a robust set of recommendations for policymakers, a clear understanding of the lessons from Central European cooperation and an actionable insights into the EU strategy for Central Asia. Furthermore, we have delved into the geopolitical shifts brought forth by the conflict in Ukraine and explored the vital issues of water and climate change cooperation. The panel highlight will be published on the Cover.Doc Asia platform following tonight's event and, rec and the recording will be uploaded on Kabar Doc Asia YouTube channel. Look it up and subscribe. And we conclude, let us carry forward the spirit of collaboration and the valuable knowledge exchanged here today to strengthen the bonds between our regions. We must continue to build on this momentum and I trust that each other, one of us will play a pivotal role in this collective journey. Thank you. Once again, for your valuable time and insights, stay connected, stay engaged, stay tuned for such expert meetings in the future. Please also follow IWPR Central Asia social media channels and the website www.kabar.asia and join the upcoming events. We look forward to our paths crossing again in future dialogues. Goodbye and be well until we meet again.